During the last few episodes, we were talking about the establishment of British control in northern India. We had a discussion of how the East India Company began to control the entire region politically, uh, new administrative structures were created, and uh, the commerce of the region passed into their hands. Around the same time, similar processes were at work at Dakin or the Deccan. You know, 18th century Deccan was a scene of frequent military conflicts. You have the Marathas, you have the territories of the, controlled by the Mughal Viceroy at Hyderabad, the Nizamul Mulk. In this constellation of regional powers in the Deccan, Mysore emerged as perhaps the greatest threat to the company, partly because of the ability on the part of the rulers of Mysore to increase the military power of the state. But military power alone was not uh, the foundation of uh, their strength. Uh, they also developed the economic resources, which is why some scholars often describe uh, the state of Mysore in the 18th century, created by Hyder Ali, and the tradition continued by Tipu as an enlightened despotism. So why is it called enlightened despotism? They describe it as enlightened despotism, and the comparison with Europe may not be so relevant or may not be so useful. But there are yardsticks of comparison, because as some of the uh, improving enlightened rulers of Europe uh, tried to develop their own states economically, the rulers of Mysore did exactly the same. Apart from centralizing the administration, which was certainly an administrative necessity or administrative compulsion, they made provisions for loans to the peasants. Peasants who didn't have enough resources were given loans in the form of cattle, in the form of seeds, in order to carry on cultivation. And the objective was to create agricultural resources. Revenue system was streamlined uh, with the objective of uh, um, getting as much as one could from territorial revenue. But in order that the peasant could be able to pay this revenue, there were attempts at the same time by these rulers, by Tipu and Haider, to offer them loans in order that they could actually improve on cultivation. So there was an attempt uh, certainly to increase the economic resources of the land in order to make it uh, militarily more powerful. They were interested in commerce. Malabar was occupied and there were political military reasons for it, but Malabar was also important for trading purposes. Uh, his ships laden with Indian luxuries and spices would sail to Constantinople. He would send mission to Constantinople, not merely to forge political linkages with the Caliph of Turkey, but also to explore possibilities of uh, commerce in this region from Mysore. Mangalore was uh, emerging as a very important port uh, on the in the Konkan coast under the rulers of Mysore. And the occupation of Malabar obviously gave them access to uh, one of the commercially rich areas, one of the great centers of spice trade. Hyder and then his son Tipu during those four decades when the sultans of Mysore were in power, uh, tried to build a powerful state in the region to be able to contain the British. Containing the British also became one of the main objectives. And in order to achieve that objective, Hyder initially, and then this strategy was continued by Tipu as well, tried to create 
great coalition of Indian powers. But this coalition was not likely to survive. Sir, why didn't the Indian combination work? There were a number of reasons for this. In the first place, if you look at the ancestry of Hyder Ali, Hyder Ali, by in the perception of uh, the Nizam, was an unruly upstart, a man who uh, had achieved power by marginalizing the existing Hindu rulers of Mysore, Chikka Devu Vadiyar, taking advantage of the conflict between Vadiyar and his Prime Minister Nanjaraj. So during the Carnatic Wars, Hyder Ali gathered some experience, rebuilt an army, forced Nanjaraj out of power, and then although he gave nominal acknowledgement to Vadiyar's rulership, virtually he became the ruler of Mysore. And this was recognized by the Mughals when Nizam actually gave him the title of Nawab. But it was a recognition of power, but Nizam wouldn't accept him as an equal, as a person with whom this kind of a combination can be struck in order to contain the British. Secondly, and this is my in my assessment, maybe the kind of commitment to this kind of a cause also lacks. Because all of these powers, the Nizam on the one hand and uh, the Marathas on the other, were interested in their small territorial gains. So occasionally they would side with the rulers of Mysore for a certain cause and then they would desert them. And this was to happen time and again. There were moments when the Marathas were friendly or the Nizam was unfriendly when both were friendly, but there would be moments when both were unfriendly and were willing to desert Tipu Sultan by striking alliances with uh, the British, which they did a number of times. And uh, thirdly, if you talk about the Marathas, as you know, the Maratha state itself was in doldrums because the control of Pune, whereas you know the Peshawar had taken over power from the house of Sivaji earlier, about which we'll talk about later, was losing control over these great Maratha generals who had set up their own uh, independent centers of power. The Holkars were stationed in uh, Indore, the southern part of Malwa, Mughal province of Malwa. The Sindhyas were more interested in the north. Some, for some time, Sindhya was controlling Delhi. And he was ultimately entrenched in Gwalior. The Gaikwad had moved to Baroda in the Gujarat region. So it was difficult also for the Peshwa to bring all these Maratha leaders together. Because even if they would actually, as they did in 1761 when Abdali invaded, India or they organized an army and went up to Panipat to fight him. But it was difficult to keep this combination together. I think these should be the structural explanations for the failure ultimately on the part of either Hyder Ali or Tipu Sultan to keep the coalition that he wished to create together. So this is a situation where they had to depend on the French. Sir, uh, how far the French could be relied upon? That's an interesting question. I mean, if you look at the history of Mysore's relations with the English and the French playing their part as a support, it becomes clear that they are not very consistent. I mean, they certainly pledged support. They gave uh, either a certain assurance and uh, 
particularly during the Second Mahaisal War, when Hyder was campaigning in the Carnatic, a small contingent of French forces came, but they didn't wish to take part in the war unless Hyder had made a lump sum and some payment. So Hyder refused to pay, and the French were standing there. I mean, were not in a mood to fight the war. In the midst of the war, when the war was continuing in December 1782, Hyder died. You know that there were a number of phases. I mean, there are four wars. First war was in the late 1760s, when Hyder had some success in the Carnatic, but ultimately a kind of peace was restored. I am talking about the second war, which was more uh, elaborate and which was more extensive, which continued for some time. It started around 1780 and then continued till uh, 1784 when his son, uh, Tipu Sultan, signed that famous Treaty of Mangalore. So both Haider at the time of his death and Tipu Sultan, uh, when he became his successor, expected that French would give them enough support, I mean, uh, support good enough for them to contain the British. This never happened. So Bussi, who was to come from France and join the French forces in southern India in order to rally behind Tipu, proved to be extremely untrustworthy or proved to be extremely fickle. He came, he had mm, no concrete plan to work out his strategies against the British. Uh, he was needlessly waiting and uh, going to the extent of uh, suggesting secret negotiations with the Marathas and Nizam, the two adversaries, or the two friends who turned adversaries by defecting the great coalition and siding with the British. So, I would imagine that the French were not so trustworthy in the way Tipu or Haider expected them to be. Uh, the kind of straightforwardness that you come across in Tipu's dealings with his enemies or with the British even was not uh, visible in the French conduct uh, with them. And, you know, this was not very unusual because this was a period or this was the time when treachery was the order of the day. And the kind of straightforwardness that Tipu Sultan was expecting from the French or from the others was never reciprocated. So, the French option was a necessity, but whether in the long run or whether in Tipu's or Haider's attempts to create a powerful anti-English coalition, the French had been able to play the expected role is a matter uh, to be debated. Uh, I don't think that the, the support that the French gave or uh, was adequate. Uh, even though Haider and later Tipu continued to value the French friendship. They, they were sending embassies or to France or uh, after the revolution, Tipu went to the extent of planting a liberty tree at Seringapatnam. And in fact, as you know, that this was also Tipu's undoing. Because when the British realized that there is always this possibility of a powerful Indian state forging intimate links with a power capable of containing the British or fighting the British in the continent of Europe or here. And I know that Napoleon was in 1798 emerging as a major threat in Europe on behalf of the revolutionary army. And there was also a change in the in India because by then Cornwallis had left, or John uh, or John Shore had also left. Wellesley had taken over, and Wellesley's imperialism demanded a certain kind of forward policy, or inspired him to take a forward policy here. And uh, so, um, when Tipu uh, was actually showing signs of opening negotiations with the French. Uh, forging close relationship with the French, the British took a learn.
So in a sense, that was also the source of his undoing as far as Tipu's relationship with the British uh, was concerned. But what is important is that Haider and Tipu together had taken a position a position against the inexorable British advance. Even though there were speculations that Haider, uh, towards the last part of his life, when he was dying in the midst of war, was actually taught, thinking of establishing peace with the English. But I have my own doubts. Sir, if Haider was so pessimistic about the outcome, then why did Tipu continue with his struggle against the English? That is the question. I mean, a, one British officer, Mark Wilkes, actually wrote about Tipu confiding to his Prime Minister, Pandit Purnaya, the famous man who served either and then also served Tipu. And this also um, is a, a corrective to the general impression that Haider and Tipu's regime was a communal regime. I mean, and they might have uh, proselytized, I mean, they might have followed some measure of proselytization in Malabar for some time. But if you look at Mysore, they had Hindu officials who were great support to them. According to Wilkes version, that Haider in 1782, before his death, when he saw that the great coalition had dissolved and Nizam and um, the Marathas were not willing to give Haider the kind of support that they had promised against the British. Apparently, Haider actually confided to uh, Purnaya that the British were unstoppable and therefore it would be wise for his son to come to an agreement with uh, the British. Now, there is another account, a Kannad account called Haider Nama in which there is a description of the war council meeting in which Haider was spelling out the future plans of action. I mean emphasizing how it was important not merely to revive the idea of coalition, the kind of great coalition that Haider had, had in his mind, but also to forge more intimate links with rulers of Iran, Afghanistan and France to cultivate international support in order to vanquish and in order to fight an enemy which was so exceedingly powerful, in order to fight the British. So the argument or the idea that Haider was turning into a defeatist in 1782 at the moment of his death it is not really acceptable. And this is the reason why you find that Tipu was continuing with his war against the British even after his death. Till 1784, the Mangalore was under British control for some time. The Mangalore was besieged by Tipu's forces. And that would have been a very decisive war, you know. In the Battle of Kaddalore, towards the close of 1793, Bussi had the opportunity to inflict a major defeat on the English forces, which he didn't complete. Which is the reason why it remained an indecisive kind of a, a, a military engagement, compelling Tipu Sultan to come to an agreement with the British in, in the Treaty of Mangalore in 1784. Even if he signed the Treaty of Mangalore, he was not willing to be cowed down so totally because the next year he issues an embargo, embargo against British commerce at Malabar. So that is also one reason why Malabar's spice trade was an important consideration for the British. You know, the, in the Third War. Uh, when Cornwall is able to outwit uh, Tipu Sultan, create that combination again of Nizam and the Marathas, defeated Tipu Sultan in the war and finally signed the Treaty of Seringapatnam, 
the immediate step after the treaty of seringapatnam in which tipu had to give away malabar to the british was an elaborate administrative paraphernalia that began to be followed in malabar itself i mean they were trying to impose direct control over malabar so this is very significant because malabar was always an important center of spice trade the english who was looking at malabar very lustingly from bombay and uh, tipu was also trying to deprive them of easy access to the spice sources the french are operating from mahe which is very close to kozhikode or kalikat as it was called so given this kind of a situation the kind of policy that cornwallis adopts after the third war after the treaty of sirangapatnam in which tipu signed accepted defeat and gave away malabar you see the intention very clearly on the one hand you have a nawab who was not willing to be completely outclassed militarily or to be co- to accept so willingly british suzerainty or british dominance you have on the other hand british trading interest in the region which were actually trying to establish control over malabar in order to keep down the spices prices of spices at a reasonable level you have small rajas on the coast who are constantly actually com- uh, negotiating with the british as the travancore did and in fact intervention in travancore in 1790 was the occasion when the third anglo mysore war started so i don't think that um, this argument of hyder's defeatism is acceptable on the contrary we can see how the spirit of animosity continues how attempts were again made by tipu to create that combination although it failed because of other reasons because of the reasons which i have already explained but finally you come to that uh, final war in 1799 when as you know a, the british imperialism acquires a new character a new thrust wellesley adopts new expansionist strategies and ultimately here to die fighting on the outskirts the outskirts of sirangapatnam and that was the end of uh, a major resistance uh, undertaken by one of the most promising 18th century states but it had a long term impact once the mysore state was finished it was the turn of the marathas because the marathas in any case were so divided that it was very difficult for them to create or to to continue with their war or to to sustain that combination against the british and it is important or you can see how between say 1800 and 1818 in two decades the marathas gave way the british managed to knock them down one by one and finally the complete control of the over deccan was established by 1818 a new empire was being born but to that story will turn later so as we try to wind up this part of the discussion you see a few very important points in the first place mysore was an example of a brilliant state for building i mean it was an example of how uh, there was a certain vision of modernity evident in some of its policies combining military power trying to set up a navy Uh, and combining all this with a certain commitment to create a prosperous state to increase economic resources of the land uh, going to the extent of establishing some kind of a state trading corporation uh, which was interest which is a government body a state body interested in business second this powerful state naturally emerged as 
the most important threat in the region. Even though the Marathas were there and they were going to um, uh, they remain there for another couple of decades, but they were unable to create this kind of a combination or they were unable to create this kind of uh, power which Mysore was able to galvanize in its attempt to resist the British. And thirdly, the failure of the coalition. It is a very important question which you are trying to address in almost all these discussions on how the British were able to establish their political control in South Asia. I mean, at times they came together, but most of the time they were drifting apart. It was easy for the British to play on their local territorial ambitions to pit one against the other. Given this, the Hyder's vision and the same strategy that was continued by Tipu to create this coalition, I think was a great event, was a very important uh, vision that one must recognize despite the fact that it did not succeed. I mean, there are many failures in history, but this is one such failure in which you can see a grand vision emerging from uh, Tipu's or Hyder's mind uh, to create a coalition against the British. You can call it proto-nationalist. It is not nationalism, but it was anticipating some kind of a national coalition against the enemy, the Firangi, the foreigner.